Tavis Smiley, April 1967, Martin Luther King. What was he doing a year before his death? April 4, 1967 to be exact, Peter, he's here in New York where we sit today uh, at the Riverside Church delivering the most controversial speech of his entire life. The speech was uh, called Beyond Vietnam, uh, a time to break the silence. And King in that speech comes out as he had before, but in that speech in this gathering of 4,000 plus people at Riverside Church with uh, all kinds of anti-war organizations and individuals opposed to the Vietnam War, King gives, delivers this speech beyond Vietnam and he uses a phrase that gets him demonized by the American media the very next morning. And the phrase in the speech is this. He refers to his country, the U.S. of A, as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He makes a strong and principled, um, brilliantly laid out argument for why he's opposed to the Vietnam War and how these bombs that are are dropping in Vietnam are really falling in the ghettos and barrios of, of America. But that phrase, Peter, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Now, here's a guy who's been very involved in voting rights and civil rights. But when you start talking about foreign policy, there was this sort of undercurrent, this sentiment that, Negro, we don't give you license to talk about those issues. Stay in your lane. You don't talk about foreign policy. And then when you come out as a black man, a Nobel laureate at this point, but you call your country, the U.S. of A, at the height of war, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, the editorial pages the next day ripped him. And from that day, April 4, 67, to a year to the day later, April 4, 68, King becomes in the last year of his life, for all that we're celebrating for today, he was persona non grata in this country. Everybody everything turned against him. Tavis Smiley, in your new book, Death of a King, the real story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final year, you say that he turned down two invitations mm -hmm. to the White House prior to that speech. He did, because he knew that LBJ, who we famously know was really good at twisting arms, wanted to get into a sort of tete-a-tete -tete with him about the Vietnam War. And King was unalterably opposed to our involvement in this, uh, this military excursion. And he didn't want to get into this sort of arm twisting back and forth with, with Johnson. His principles were clear. We do not need to be involved in this Vietnam War. And his whole, you know, his whole ethos was about, of course, nonviolence. And it wasn't just nonviolence for American children. It's nonviolence for Vietnamese children. And so he's sitting <clears throat> in a restaurant one day looking at a magazine, and he sees um, the bodies of Vietnamese babies who have been napalmed to death. And he's in the middle of his meal and he just stops eating. And one of his aides say to him, Doc, does the food not taste any good? You wanna get something else? He says, no, this food or any other food will never taste good to me ever again if I don't do everything I can to stop this war in Vietnam. And it becomes a crusade for him. So in the last year of his life, he's talking about what he calls the triple threat that really is going to destroy our democracy if we don't get our arms around it. And the triple threat for King was racism, poverty, and militarism. So fast forward almost 50 years since his death, racism, poverty, militarism, still the same issues that threaten this very democracy. And right now, the conversation that we're starting to have about income inequality and poverty is a real conversation. But 50 years ago, King was trying to get us to deal with this. We ignored him. When he died, the last Harris poll in his life taken found, Peter, that almost three quarters of the American people had turned against him, thought he was persona non grata. 57% of his own people, black people, had turned against him. When you read this book and you see what the head of the NAACP said about Dr. King, Roy Wilkins, what Whitney Young, the head of the Urban League, said about Dr. King, what Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice, felt and said about Dr. King. He was the most controversial figure in the country, including inside of black America. So he is murdered on this balcony in Memphis a year after giving that speech to the day, April 4, 68, he's dead on that balcony. He dies not having any idea of the monument and the holiday and the postage stamp. It took us a long time to come to terms with him. The problem now is the reason why I wrote this book 
is that he's become so sanitized and so sterilized and even lionized that we really haven't come to terms with who he really was, what he really wanted us to address, and we're trying to honor him on the cheap, if you will, but we still haven't come to terms with addressing that triple threat of racism, poverty, and militarism. And were he here now, he'd be on those issues every day. <clears throat> How did you research this book? With the, with the help of a young man named Jared Hernandez, one of my staff people, who I want to give a shout out to, um, did a lot of good research uh, uh, to pull these facts together, number one. Uh, number two, my collaborator David Rich did a wonderful job on this. Um, number three, and I really could have started with this because I want to give them all the respect that I can and they deserve. His three principal biographers, Taylor Branch, David Garrell, and Claiborne Carson, who've all appeared here on C-SPAN. But Claiborne Carson, David Garrell, and Taylor Branch have done so much of the heavy lifting about the life and the legacy of King. And of course, the, the persons who work with King have all written their own individual books, from Andrew Young to, to Dorothy Cotton to Clarence Jones, so many people around him. But it was a matter of taking so much of the scholarship and the facts that are already there that are kind of hidden in plain sight and coalescing them to tell the story of just the last year. That's what this book is only about. This one year, the last year of his life, from April 4, 67, when he gives that speech beyond Vietnam and the nation turns against him, to literally April 4, 68, 12 months to the day later when he's killed. Now, conspiracy theorists have had you know, years to, to, to toy with and to try to unpack what April 4, 67 as compared to April 4, 68, what does that really mean? And there are a lot of things I think that one can read into that. But I really just wanted to, to, to delve into why this speech was so um, controversial and what price he had to pay for standing up so courageously and coming out against the war and what the White House did to him, what the media, the liberal media, when you read this book and you see what the New York Times and the Washington <coughs> Post had to say about King, and then white America turns against him, black America turns against him. I mean, that's the story about King that we don't want to tell. It's so much easier, again, to put him on a postage stamp, to give him a monument, to have a holiday. But how do we come to terms with his real legacy of justice for all, service to others, and a love that liberates people? And his message is still so unsettling that we don't want to come to terms with it even 15 years later. Tavis Smiley, was he aware of the impact that speech was going to have? He knew going into it, Peter, that there were going to be some consequences and repercussions. He did not know that the fallout the next day was going to be so universal and so, uh, so damning. He did something different that night than he'd ever done, including when he delivered the I Have a Dream speech in 63. Now, this speech beyond Vietnam, April 4, 67. Four years prior, in August, um, August 28 and 63, and I have, a dream, I have a dream speech in Washington, King did not deliver, or distribute rather, his team did not distribute advanced copies of his talk. For the Beyond Vietnam speech, because he was laying out such a point-by-point -point case for why we needed to get out of Vietnam, his team convinced him that the editorial boards of all the major papers needed to have an advanced copy of this particular speech. So they distributed that copy before King uh, mounted the podium at the Riverside Church here in New York. So he was told by his people that that distribution of the speech in advance uh, would help him get his message out. It did the exact opposite because every major paper in the country had the speech in advance. The next morning, every major paper in the country, liberal to conservative, completely ripped him to shreds. So he had never had the experience of one day, one time, in every major paper in the country being so demonized. And again, when you read the liberal papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post and how they dismissed him, said he was a discredit to his race, that he had outlived his usefulness, it's hard to see in this moment how even the liberal establishment could have been so turned off to Dr. King. Did he meet with President Johnson in the last year of his life? He did not um, in the last year. They did not have occasion to meet. Um, again, King didn't want to get into the arm twisting. And he canceled a couple of meetings before he gave that particular speech. But after he gave the speech, the White House wanted really nothing to do with him because they saw him as, a, as an enemy. And then the whole, they tried to put the communist thing on him. And what the White House did do 
as White Houses always do, is to reach out to their friends, their sur 